Juno-winning Canadian singer-songwriter Ron Sexsmith has returned with a brand new album entitled Long Player, Late Bloomer, his 11th solo studio album. And his latest record marks something of a departure, perhaps even a leap, you might say, for the venerated songsmith. And that has much to do with who Ron Sexsmith enlisted to help him realize his songs, superstar producer Bob Rock. Now, on paper, it looks like an odd pairing. Ron Sexsmith is renowned for his quiet, introspective songs. Bob Rock has made his reputation based on work with such in-your-face acts as Metallica and Motley Crue. But the results of their collaboration, a kinship that's also captured in the new documentary Love Shines, speaks for itself. Long player, late bloomer, showcases a newly poppy and more polished, perhaps, Ron Sexsmith, but with the depth and melodic ingenuity that has made him one of the most acclaimed songwriters of our era. I just ask Paul McCartney and Elvis Costello. Ron Sexsmith joins me live in Studio Q. I won't be able to get my head out the door after all that. There's so. your proper introduction. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thanks. We've it's so uh, it's always good to see you. It's been a, a, many many years. We've uh, yeah, uh, I've known you. Yeah, going back to the Moxie Fruvis days, and uh, yeah, we did that uh, tour together in 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 '95 in the U.S. And you guys were uh, packing them in everywhere. That was that uh, was great. And, and and I would just sit there and watch your your set every day, marveling. Really? Well, yeah. Man. Well, I, I, I just was blown, you know, by the end of the night, everyone, I mean, it was really cool what you guys did, you know, I know, you know, I mean, you're really, the college kids were totally digging it. And now, now Dave is in in my band, he's playing That's with right. me, so they're right. colleagues. Playing, so, playing yeah. piano. The thing is, you were 31 years old when you recorded your major label debut. Does the song Late Bloomer from this new record uh, characterize the way you see yourself? Um, I, I think, you know... Things seem to take longer for me, you know. I mean, I, I don't I don't even think I started singing any good until about my seventh album, you know. Um, like Retriever is around the time where I started sounding kind of like I wanted to sound. I, I felt my voice used to um, vibrate too much in the beginning. And then I tried to whittle away at that, and, that, and I felt for a few albums it sounded almost like Kermit the Frog, you know. And I'm sort of trying to... I'm a work in progress, and I guess that was part of, um, you know the idea behind the, the title. I mean, Late Bloomer, the song itself was actually a bit of a joke because I was I was writing more about how, how um, in my, you know, advancing years, I, I find I'm becoming more of a curmudgeon, you know, <laughs> and it was more about waking up to that sort of thing. You know, I remember I was in a cafe and I was overhearing this table of sort of younger people going on about how great something was going to be and I was saying all this stuff under my breath and just feeling like a you know Walter Matthau or something <laughs> and so that's kind of where the the song came from I wasn't referring to myself uh, getting better looking or anything you know? well, tell, tell me yeah. about this uh, although that's true as well, well surely you look uh, great uh, tell me about this uh this notion that this record is about your attempt, I mean, it certainly pointedly said so in, in the film, and, and we can hear that this is a perhaps more of a commercial outing. Tell me about this decision, A, to go with Bob Rock and make a, a record that you overtly wanted to make more commercial. Well, it's not the first time. You know, to be honest with you, every record I've ever made, I've, wanted, I've tried to make a hit record. You know, it's not my motivation when I'm writing songs or anything, but... Um, you know, I'm 47, and the songs that I heard growing up were very melodic, and that's the kind of stuff I gravitate towards. And so, you know, songs even on, you know, pretty much on any one of my records, they all sounded like hits to me. But for mm. some reason, in the production of the record or in my singing, I could never quite make that translate, or I could never connect in a way that whatever, like Blue Rodeo or whoever it is that was, you know, selling records. And and I've been sort of inching my way towards that. And and after the last two records, uh, Exit Strategy and Time Being, they were both, um, you know, they basically came out and died the next day. And I was starting to get a bit frustrated. I felt my career was getting away from me. And so I... Died I, the next day, meaning you, you just didn't sell I, as many records as you well, wanted? Because I mean, they got acclaimed. They, well, they never, I've never been a huge seller to begin with. But I just felt... I remember with Exit Strategy of the Soul... You know, which maybe the title was doom, dooming the record from the start. I don't know, but um, I, I remember about six months after the record came out, people were asking me, "When's your record coming out?" You know, and there was this thing like I didn't. Yeah. I was just getting really, uh, you know, and I know, I, I, I should, I, I didn't even take it personally because uh, you know, these days with the record industry the way it's it the is, the way it is, it's ephemeral. Yeah. Albums don't have the life, right. the long life they used to. But even I, the biggest stars, yeah. Gaga or Bieber, are, are just putting them out, putting out stuff yeah. every six months. And right? some some people aren't even putting out records. They're they're you know starting a 
clothing lines or you know whatever right. you know, or, they, or they keep repackaging their old hits or something but i i'm really into albums which is why the other you know the other half of the title long player it was, it was you know the original title was actually long playing disc um but anyway i had these songs and i was afraid to make another record and i was trying to figure out i wanted to find someone who could help me make a record you know because for years people are always going on about how you know good i'm supposed to be but i i always feel i fall short of you know people there's people that either they haven't heard of me or or they don't get me or whatever i want to try to find someone to help me frame the songs in a way that you know people would actually hear it for a change and and bob i uh it was actually michael bubley who recommended him and right. when i heard i thought bob like most people i thought he just did hard rock music until i i found out that he'd worked with bubley so Ron, let me get into this. This idea that you, I, I, I don't, I don't uh, that you want hits. You want a, a commercial record that it's not fame. It's not about fame. Or but what is it about? Because uh, I, I mean, and I don't want to ask it facetiously, yeah. but why do you care? You know, people. It's it's almost <laughs> like. You know, people always want what they don't have. There's, yeah. there's, there's bands out there. There's artists out there selling a lot of records or doing really well that would die for the kind of integrity yeah. and acclaim that you've gotten, right? Uh, and from other artists and from well, critics. Yeah. Uh, but you, <laughs> yeah. you, I mean, would you trade that to sell a million records? No, it's not even about that. It, it's, uh, you know, it, but you're right though. I mean, there's people like Bon Jovi who would all he wants now is respect you know right. i mean he's trying to make these records all of a sudden you know, where he's like dylan or something like that you know and it, and people just just do your arena rock that's what they want from you you know and i am very grateful to, i mean just i was like you said i was 31 when my first record came out which isn't old but it's old you know for me in music years and um and i was just really lucky that i could have a career but you know, for me, it's more about trying to improve my situation. It's not about money or fame. You know, like I have a great band, for example, that I can almost never afford to take on the road with me, you know. Or or if I do, I lose my shirt or something. I mean, I'm taking them out on the road with me, with me this time because I was trying to... I wanted to come out and try to at least duplicate the sound, you know, or come close to it anyway, mm. the sound of the record. Um, you know, and fame is, especially these days, has been cheapened so much by the, whatever, the Kardashians and all that kind of stuff, you know, that whole sort of this culture mm -hmm, we live mm -hmm. in now. So that's never meant anything to me. It's, it's, but, you know, the other side of it is, you know, you work hard on the songs and you, you, you want, you know, you want people to hear them. And, 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 you know, my, I grew up when my heroes were people like Elton John, who were, he was essentially right. an album artist, but he had hits on the radio. Right. And that's, I know that was a different time. And even now this record, it doesn't sound like what mainstream radio plays, even though it's probably the, the sort of poppiest thing I've done. You know. But, you know, there's this in your, do in this documentary, which is fascinating, by the way, uh, musician Steve Earle, a, a man who himself, uh, carries a lot of respect and credibility and integrity. He kind of chides you a little bit. Uh, yeah. He says, uh, you could see it as fortunate that anyone knows who you are, given <laughs> that there, that many worthy artists and songwriters fly a little under the radar. Oh, exactly. So yeah. what, what do you... <laughs> well, I mean, you get that you, you have a great deal of acclaim, you know, uh, yeah. well-deserved. Yeah. No, I have so much to be thankful for. And sometimes when you're depressed, it's hard to see that, you know, and I think when the movie captures me at a time when I was really down in the dumps, you know, I did this tour for my last record where, you know, it was like every city on earth, basically. And, you know, my last album had horns and everything, and I wasn't able to do that live. I did spent the whole tour with pretty much just my bass player. And again, these are all, it's all relative, you know. I mean, I, I'm really lucky to have a career at all. And the fact I go and play, but still in, in my little world, you know, I was depressed that I had to go out on stage every night and put on a show. Like I remember David Byrne came to see me in San Francisco. And I... I was so nervous all day because I heard he was coming and I was going, oh, I bet he thinks I'm going to have Cuban horns and all this stuff. And, uh, <laughs> you know, meanwhile, I walk out there with just my bass player and I was getting, I was putting on a lot of weight and I remember I didn't want people even looking at me. And so when I look back on the tour now, I just think uh, I want to give everybody their money back. Um, and so the film captures me at this time where I, I felt like I needed to do something drastic. Mm. But I know you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm really lucky. There's a lot of people who would love to be in my situation. Um, but it's still, I was go, it's still okay to go for something, though, you know, to try for something. Songs are real tools for yeah. you. There's a fascinating moment in, in the documentary when you say, and which is based on the making of this record, by the way, uh, when you say you can, you, you can be a better person in your songs. You feel like you're a better person in your songs than you are in real life. I feel, yeah, sometimes. What do you I, mean by that? 
Well, you know, in a song you get to um, take the time and say things the way you, doc- you know, uh, I, I have a hard, I've always had a hard time, maybe it's just my upbringing or whatever, but, um, exp- you know, expressing myself in, a- in real life, you know, but in a song you can kind of, what, ha- what comes out in the song oftentimes is your best aspects, you know, the things, the person you want to be, um, uh, you know, that it's almost impossible to live up to sometimes. And I, and I guess in the film I was referring to my, uh, you know, my family days where I, you know, I was kind of an absentee dad and I was doing all the stupid things you do on mm-hmm. the road and having a, having the time of my life and then feeling really guilty and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, meanwhile, you're writing this song, it's, you know, it's, this, this love song. And um, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, there's a lot going on at once. People are complex, you know, and, and I'm, but I, I guess that's what I was referring to. I mean, sometimes I disappoint myself as a person and then I try to make it up to you know in a song, and uh, you know because I, I, ultimately I'm going to be gone, and the song's going to be what's you know mm. hanging around. You know? Well, you got a lot of songs that are that are hanging around in a really <laughs> positive way. I want to make sure we have enough time for you to you to play. Right. D- back to the idea of this. Uh, of the aspirations around this record and the commerciality of it. And by the way, a, a, a most listenable and, and an enjoyable record. I think this is going to, well, I would think that mm-hmm. this would get, uh, take you to a, a different level in terms of the accessibility. Well, even of, just a bump, you know, it, it's just more of just, you want people to know it exists, I guess. But it, it, we see this in the documentary and, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a difficult one to bring up. The, the, so after making the record, Warner Brothers America, yeah, yeah. uh, actually passes on it and says this would be better with an indie label sorry we're not gonna and then an indie <laughs> label passes on it and says it's too mainstream like you're kind of yeah. damned if you do if you damn if you damned if you don't warner music canada is going full strong uh championing yeah. this uh in a big way but do you feel like there's more riding on this record than than previous discs you know i i did feel like that going into it i mean it seemed to be an insane uh undertaking just even coming up with the money to start the record especially in this day and age you know um but you know in the film i, I guess it, it gets a bit melodramatic where i and i and that's just where i was at at the time where i'm saying you know if this record doesn't do anything i might have to just step away but i felt that in the past you know and even you know elton john said i'm never making another record you know yeah. but it's kind of what we do right it's like well even this record, I never planned on making it. I, I didn't expect to write some new songs. And what happens is you're, it's like the Charlie Brown thing. You're always trying to kick the football, you know. You, 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 you write a bunch of new songs, get your hopes up again, and you're, and you're back into it. And it's this vicious circle. And I, I, and I, um, that's, you know, and I love being a songwriter. And, I, and I've already written my next record. You know, so. <laughs> right. Um, right. But, but there is a lot writing on it in... in um, uh, just in my own little world. I mean, I've put a lot into it and I'm, I'm hoping, you know, there's, uh, you know, people that I work with and the labels are all kind of, everyone's working hard to not sort of drop the ball, you know, this time. And I think it's been fumbled in the past, you know. It's, it's, I thank you so much for being here and for the oh. candor. I'm, I'm very uh, excited <laughs> to have you playing a, a, a song here live in Studio Q. You're going to play the song Love Shines. I will, yeah. It's the title of the film and also the first song you wrote for this album. You want to say anything about the song before you play? Well, the opening line, in every nowhere town there are somewhere dreams, that was all I had for the longest time. And I just walked around thinking about that, you know, and, and then... You know, I find with every album there's a song that triggers the rest of the, the rest of the batch, and and that was the song. And it's funny because I always imagine it being the first song on the record, but the way Bob produced it, it became much much more of an event, and it, mm. it just seemed like it, it needed to be, you know, like almost like the closing number. It's the sec- second last song now. It's the one that kind of. You know the climax, I guess. Now <laughs> I love the way that you yeah. still think of it as an album, oh, side not, a, not as a collection of songs on an iPod that people are randomly. I don't even have an to. iPod, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Head on over there. I have a Viewmaster, though. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Viewmaster, the original iPod. 